you still have the crack. They'll be slagging me, like, you know yeah. what happened? Yeah, here comes but, County now. Yeah, and especially about that one-liner, let's go party, they'll be slagging <laughs> me about that. And Did they have the Aquaman uh, video going around? Oh, or? yeah, I'd imagine they do. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, everyone's seen at this stage. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, they'll definitely be slagging me about that, and that's great to bring, bring you back down to earth. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. So the Hurler of the Year nominations are out, and Noel McGrath is not amongst the three names. I know Woolley would have a fit now if he's sitting in Australia thinking, why are these boys talking about hurling? Connor and Conan. <laughs> you know, the lunatics are running the asylum. But you know, I'm going to go for it. I had a hurling show in the summer. Well, and Noel McGrath good. popped up every single episode. And I have to say, it just feels like there's no no justice in the world. It's obviously, so TJ Reid, Patrick Horgan, Seamus Callanan. Very good names. It's, it's, you know, three top names. He had three amazing years as well. But I'm sorry, but like the... the Tougher decision had to be made amongst Reed and Horgan. Like Noel McGrath had to be in there just to run through it. Man in the match in the semi final, man in the match in the final. He scored four points to play against Wexford when he had fourteen men. Really came to the fore in that game when yep. they were under the pump. Uh five points down against Cork, thirty minutes to go in the Monster Championship. It was him who dragged the team forward again. Remember he won that free in the celebration he did, like must have been about five fist pumps. Like you don't don't normally see Noel McGrath doing that. You don't normally see him breaking his ice cool character. But it was like, lads, we need to step up here. I remember his interview afterwards. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. It was just how every single player needs to be bigger when they wear that Tipperary jersey and the way he called it that Tipperary jersey. Mm. You know, and but look, you know, we're not we're not deciding on interviews afterwards. His pass against Leash for the Seamus Callanan goal. The biggest compliment I can pay him is that it was Jim McConnell esque. You know, but like the <laughs> flight, the flight of the ball is that it. It sort of f- feels like it's going to it's going to fade out twenty meters short, but it doesn't. It just yeah. keeps going like a natural, like any normal person, like me or you playing that pass, it w- it would drop twenty meters further than where he drops it, and it just keeps going. Takes out like six defenders with the one pass, and you think each one of them are going to intercept it. They don't because it's Noel McGrath. Mm. He thinks better than us. He acts better than us. He is better than us. And I cannot believe that he's omitted from the All-Star Hurling nominations. No, whoa, whoa. <laughs> he is not omitted from the All-Star Hurling Sorry. nominations from Easy. Hurler of the Year. Uh, I'm not sure how I can add to that glowing recommendation <laughs> of Noel McGrath. The only thing I'll say is that um, I'll defer to my hurling expert here after the show during the summer, but... <laughs> Um, what I what I had seen this summer was was kind of what you indicated there that he was involved in a lot of big moments, um, and that coming down towards the stretch and particularly against Wexford because the final just took on a life of its own after the sending off, yeah. but the semi final in particular where there there was men that were needed to step up it was Noel McGrath who stepped up, and he's done he's done that for he's done that for a long time too. Like I I like you mentioned the Jeremy Connolly comparison there. Noel McGrath has always been one of my favorite hurlers to watch because. Yeah. Um, and again, don't want to talk too much about football relating it to hurling, but stick to what we know. He's, yeah, well, he's the he's the closest thing to me to a classic number eleven in terms yeah. of Gaelic football. Like I, I'm thinking of Brian McGuigan, uh, Kieran McDonald from my own county. That uh, even when you like in a hurling context, seems to have more time than anybody else. Yeah. seems to have just more time when he's on the just more time when he's on the ball. Always picks the right option and picks an option that well, even like uh, like somebody who wouldn't be into hurling wouldn't have noticed, but I would imagine that a lot of hurling people wouldn't have seen beforehand as well. Just so much class, so much craft. Around. Yeah. Just, like I know he went back to midfield this year, but around that middle eight. And I remember going back to, um, it was 2010, I think, under the previous Sheedy era, and Michael Brick Walsh was having this amazing year for Waterford. Yeah. Norman McGrath played centre forward on him and like um, took him for a ride, basically. So... <laughs> Uh, similar form I would have thought this year like it's just he's probably unlucky uh, like the the quality of contenders I don't know like Patrick Horgan is a genius but I'm like how often and this is probably a testament to how good he's been how good he is how often does a, a, a player that's knocked out in the quarterfinals get nominated for Hurler of the Year? Yeah, I sort of like that though. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, because well. there's, there's so much in the Hurling Championship now. You have was it five group games that you have? Yeah, and then yeah, they, they get knocked take out the, the league into it as well, which is considered too. Yeah, so. and if you take his six his six games, he scored seven sixty two, which is almost fourteen points a game. Yeah. And I would actually be looking at TJ Reid, which look. Any one of these four players are, aren't in it. That this would be a story. We'd be complaining about it today. Mm-hmm. Can't believe TJ Reid's <laughs> yeah, not yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but. It, but it would be between Horgan and Reed, and I would probably leave Reed out, even though Reed was spectacular as well. Like four, four amazing players. Let's get that straight. But Noel McGrath, I think it, it should be between him and Callanan for the main award, not for him to get one of the top three. Well, just just going back on that, then, like I, I thought, like maybe T.J. Reed wasn't as effectual, let's say, in the semi final against mm. Wexford. Wexford held him quite well. Obviously, the final just didn't go click any's way. Limerick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, against yeah. Limerick. Sorry, yeah. But up until that. Um, TJ Reid have been playing so well this year that like I saw I saw it being mentioned that like 
has he actually exceeded Henry Shefflin? He's been that good. Yeah. He's been that consistently good for for the last for the last few years. Repeat for the last few years in particular, when Kilkenny arguably aren't at the level that they have been in previous years. That 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 TJ Reid was that th- that good that he like people are potentially talking about him in that bracket. So maybe maybe your perception that he shouldn't be in the contenders, let's say ahead of Noel McGrath, is because of he wasn't as effective in the yeah. semi final final as he had been up to that point. But up until that point, he had been a spectacular as. Patrick Horgan is and Patrick Horgan is getting nominated on the basis of his performances up to the quarterfinals yeah. so just to make that, that, that is true that's a very good point because yeah when you have a bad semi-final and final people will use that as a stick to beat you with absolutely them. where was in the semis and <laughs> yeah. final where, yeah. was, where was Patrick Horgan <laughs> he <laughs> just know? wasn't playing yeah, yeah it's like yeah. your stock goes up when you're not playing I always say this like you know when you're injured you know, people don't really care that much about you when you're part of the team, and like you know, if your team's losing as well, you're like your stock starts plummeting. But when you're not playing and the team's oh, 100%. losing, it's like who's missing? Geez, we could do with Connor. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And people asking you when he coming back, and you're like, you didn't care about me when I was playing. <laughs> Completely. You know, but um, but no, yeah, I always think about that Laura Corbett pass in the 2010 final. I think that's when I first was like, whoa, this guy is the business. So, um, he wins the ball. Laura Corbett's come from midfield. And he's, he's going straight and like, like Tipperary have done that move where they suck everybody out, mm. leave nobody in the full forward line. Corbett takes off into the space and Noel McGrath is over his shoulder, hand pass just sort of like you're straight in front of, of Corbett. And I was thinking, how, how did you see that? Like, yeah. you know, nobody else sees that and they don't have the the balls that they, they sort of go for it as well. Like, you know, it's like one of those passes where if it doesn't come off, it's like, what is the, the hell pa- are you doing? The same pass to them, I think it could have been John Tennyson. And Larko got beyond him, and just in a complete act of desperation, he just that's fired the same one. Yeah, just <laughs> fired to her that I'm trying yeah. to like, put him off. Like, yeah, that was the one because it completely split them open. Like Kikani probably thought, like th- the way Noel McGrath was facing, we have this covered. Like he's probably going to turn and try and shoot or try and pick somebody who he can see. But he just knows what's going on around him. He is like I think Corbett called him in, in that Corbett McGrath show during the year, called him the, the ultimate quarterback. Like you know, yeah, and, yeah. And he had a great tribute to him in the last year, just how his how his career is not going to be defined by his illness that he had yeah. a few years ago. Like, and that, that's honestly the best sort of tribute I could, I could pay to him. The fact that, yeah, he's gone through this amazing, like, you know, recovery and we all, like, you know, should be paying our respects to him. But now he's, he's gone way beyond he that. He has, yeah. He's yeah. just the best hurler in the country again, yeah. or one of. But not good enough to be in the top three, no, apparently. No, probably guaranteed all star though. We'll, we'll, he'll take that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't really care. Either, <laughs> yeah. But um, I remember Shimmy Callanan saying that he probably should get it. Not himself, that Noel McGrath should probably get it. But anyway, I'm over it. Uh, Young Player of the Year nominees, Adrian Mullen. Kyle Hayes, again, who won it last year. Mm. And Rory O'Connor, Adrian Mullen, was amazing for Kilkenny this year. Just sort of, it's one of those boys when you think Kilkenny are, um, aren't going well. Then suddenly they just they just shit out somebody like Adrian yeah, Mullen. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then oh you think God. he's been around for years as well because <laughs> yeah, he's that good immediately. Exactly. Um, so Tipperary have 11 All-Star nominees. Leash, our old friends, obviously the story of the summer in some sense. Uh, they got two nominations. We're so Ender Roland and goals. There's a talk before the latter stages of the competition. We're all talking that Ender Roland is going to get the All Star, the first All Star since twenty odd years, maybe. Jesus. I wish Cheddar was here now to put us right. But um, <laughs> so Ender Roland is there, and Jack Kelly is there as well in the defence. Nobody else. So I was wondering how much is it weighted. So obviously Ross King was very good. There's, there's more people in the in the least team that could probably put their hands up and think I had a great season. We won the Joe McDonough. We beat Dublin. Mm. Gave Tipperary a game, but are are they really looking at the Joe McDonough as much as they are looking at the All Ireland Championship? And should they? Because mm. like you know, surely it's it's easier to stand out in the Joe McDonough than it is in the Munster Championship or the Leinster Championship. So, you know, yeah. they had two good games where they proved that they're up to that level, but it was only two games at that level in a sense. Well, you wonder how much those nominations are based on those actual two games as opposed yeah. to something they'd done previously. But just I suppose to look at it, like Leash beat Dublin, who you know had an amazing kind of win to to, to get through to to, to the group to, from the group stage sorry and then Galway have two nominees as well but Galway had the same point as Wexford Kilkenny and Dublin in the group stage as well so like I, I, I can't say enough having not seen enough of Leash to say whether they justified any more than two but you would have thought given the scale of the achievement I mean that's uh, you said the story of the summer it's arguable whether it is the story of the summer yeah. but it's it it's was, it was <laughs> well it was, it was mammoth at the time it was absolutely huge a massive achievement for Leash so given the scale of the achievement and considering there's what 45 nominees Maybe they could have had one or two more in there, including I think you you mentioned Ross King and a couple more lads that that might feel a little hard, hard done by. Yeah, well Bernard Brogan has been talking um, to the Irish Daily Star. It was just interesting. He was being pretty honest about the whole Jim Connolly thing. So 
obviously Woolley thought it was a really bad idea bringing him back Kane made the case that you know they, they need him because like Jim Gavin doesn't trust the bench as yeah. much anymore and like sure it showed he came, played against her own came on against Mayo and came on at half time in the final so um, sorry that was the replay the replay yeah. Yeah, he came on at half came time came on for a couple minutes in the uh, drawing game yeah he, so he was warming up for ages yeah. it wasn't that the game he dropped back into the pocket had the shot that outside of his boot oh, and went wide just at yeah. the end yeah. one that almost won it for him <laughs> yeah but um, so Bernard Brogan was talking to Derry's Daily Star and he said it was tough for me about Connolly coming back he didn't take my exact place but he did take a place on the bus and then a place on the team Jim Gavin felt that was the right thing to give the team a bit of an extra angle that's his decision as a manager he's just trying to get the best out of what's there in theory it's another body in the way for me but I've kind of gone past the personal just interesting yeah when you when you do you hear like Bernard Brogan talk again obviously he is directly affected I know they're not exactly in the same position but Bernard Brogan didn't make the panel the first day mm. he didn't get on the second day and Connolly got on both days so yeah like for me like Jamie Connolly has been there for over a decade with Dublin or almost a decade um, he's a great player everybody like, you know I remember Alan Brogan was in here a few weeks ago and the way like this is Alan Brogan like you know one of the biggest legends of all time and the way he's talking about Jamie Connolly like Willie was sort of making that case again like why would they do this why would they risk interrupting the group like and he actually said to Alan, like you know, would you be comfortable with that happening? And then Alan Brogan was like, "But I'm not Jim McConnelly." Yeah. I was like, "But you're, but you're Alan Brogan." But <laughs> but even he's like revering Jim McConnelly, sort of. And you know, I, I did hear a story when he came back, like the first session back. Apparently, it was like he had never been away. But I, I don't think that showed as much on, on the field. No, it didn't show on the field. No. But that's that's the most important thing. It's it's not what Jim McConnelly had done for the previous ten years with Dublin. If just because Jeremy Connolly had been a legend for like you know since maybe 2010 2011 yeah. if he came back this year as you said if he came back to the first training session and he looked like a guy who hadn't been involved in an intercounty setup for ages well then it's like that's sentimentality goes out the window because what I've seen actually since I think Declan Darcy um, did, a, did a good interview afterwards and he said it was kind of there was nearly they had a responsibility to, to bring German back into the Dublin family let's say and it kind of tied it, it kind of went against everything that you would have heard um, about Dublin up until this point was that sentimentality doesn't come into it and obviously it's a balance between the two because sentimentality didn't come into Bernard Brogan not making the 26 for the yeah. first day um, but I don't know like, I think that's the closest you're going to get to Bernard Brogan saying I was pissed off damn right I <laughs> yeah, was pissed off yeah. I've been busting my balls all year this guy was I'm, I'm sure he, he he wouldn't put it like this but this guy was meant to be going to Boston all of a sudden he comes back and he's taking my place on the like to, to somebody like Bernard Brogan I can only, uh, can only imagine that not getting on the team albeit a team as good as Dublin would be tough but to not get on 26 would nearly be an ultimate insult especially yeah. given the circumstances so um, it, it's, it, it has been uh, like I think in previous I think that the, a lot of the Dublin players have opened up a bit more because it's the five in a row yeah. I think if they hadn't won that you wouldn't be hearing the kind of um, that sort of talk about the sentim- sentimental treatment of Connolly that we've heard in the couple of weeks since yeah but is there like sen- sentimentality aside is sentimentality a word or is it sentiment <laughs> I think sentimentality is a word. I think so <laughs> emotion aside yeah. um like but surely from Jim Gavin's point of view it's like this guy is a, is a good player and we do need him do you know yeah regardless if he hadn't been there all year and it's like it, even if the boys have been training all year if I can convince the team that this is okay as, yeah. as a group to bring him in we should bring him in because we can use him and we're not going to use some other players who are already there yeah and I, th- I think our opinion would be different on it or my, my opinion would be different on it maybe if Conley had been himself in the in the game like he so he played against yeah. Tyrone in a nothing game played midfield was yeah, able to fair, kind of yeah. saunter around the place came on uh, against um, who came on against in the semi Mayo Connor <laughs> came on <laughs> the semi one, right, for you? only a few minutes sorry and that was purely <laughs> nearly to give the crowd a lift I forgot about that and oh, then and they the, got a lift alright <laughs> and the final comes on for a few minutes um, a couple of turnovers alright but like in, in terms of a scoring threat uh, missed a couple of chances and then didn't make a huge impact in the I mean, you talked about it here that the pass was probably the highlight, and then debatable whether he even meant that. So, like, I but I think if Jeremy Connolly come back, he made the type of impact he made against Mayo, let's say after coming on at halftime in yeah, the twenty seventeen yeah. final. Well, then nobody would be questioning. Yeah. So, like Jim Gavin wasn't to know that you know Connolly wouldn't have been you know at at the at the peak of his powers as he has been previously, and Jim Gavin was only going on the evidence that he saw training, and as you said, like first training back, it's like he's never been there. So, like you have to. You have to take Gavin 
to Gavin's side that it was, there was it was nothing really to do with sentiment sentimentality from from his point of view. Yeah, how much is like uh, money in the bank coming here as well? So we, we've all had this at club level, like you know when a young fellow is not training and then he shows up, you, mm. you'll, you'll give it to him or you'll tell him to piss off or you throw him down to the reserves or seconds team, whatever it is. But you know, there's older players who have sort of done their time, and I know this is different, this is county, but you sort of let them away with it. Like, you know, they can be away until May yeah. and then come back or they don't have to train as much. It's fine. Like, it's like they've they've given the club enough and they're still very useful for us. And like I was saying to Johnny that on Monday, if the younger boys or whoever else aren't, like, getting, like, becoming better players than these older lads who aren't training, then, like, you know, some of that's on them as well. Yeah. How much so money in the bank sort of comes into it a bit as well. He's... he's no, it, enough, uh, no it, would have come back, it would have come back into it uh, but obviously given kind of the, the, the standard of, of, of his performance let's say but like it, it comes back to what you said Keane was saying earlier money in the bank obviously weighed heavier this time around because Jim Gavin was looking at his options and he's <laughs> thinking well I, like Kevin McManaman's probably not what he used to be Cormac Costello's confidence is a bit shot from having, maybe having been starting all year and then being dropped from the team yeah. um, just coming into the Super 8s that time um, you know, he eventually bought Ber- Bernard Brogan back to the bench for for, for the twenty sixth for the second day. So I'd say that's like this year more than any other year. Money in the bank counted way more towards Connolly. Whereas yeah. I think if the same situation materialized, maybe not tw- 2018, 2017 you might not have seen it happening as it did this summer. Yeah, you needed to dip into the bank. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, think well. So. Over to me, oh, more bad news for you, Connor. So there's a financial dispute going on. And it is a bit a bit worrying just from the reports anyway that, that are out today. <coughs> so uh, the Mayo County Board are locked in a dispute with the Mayo GA International Supporters Foundation uh, and it could cost them hundreds of thousands of euros. So the supporters fund that's mentioned is backed by UK-based financial trader Tim O'Leary. Uh, there was an email sent to clubs ahead of Wednesday night's county board meeting saying that uh, this the supporters fund were withholding 250 grand of money it had raised in a row over governance so that's why they're withholding the money so um the statement that was released all, like to the clubs before wednesday's meeting uh claims that o'leary made a 150 grand personal donation um to the mayo senior football team fund on the understanding that receipts would be provided to show how that money was spent so some of the email that was circulating around and there's a bit of it here like this is from tim o'leary as per our initial flyers and promotional launch so this is all based around the new york trip right yeah like so obviously the big fundraiser that went ahead there um we've committed small percentages so this is from the money to mayo ga new york and new york ga itself as well as the mayo roscommon hospice this commitment will be honored we have to support local initiatives the remainder of funds collected um, will then be allocated to Mayo GA projects back home in Mayo as promised. Supporters have bought tables on the expectation that the major benefactors within Mayo GA would be threefold. The proposed new training facility, the new underage academy initiative and other general player welfare and development initiatives for all players at all levels and codes and not just the senior football team. So this was around May when they did this. They had this gala. Um, supporters fund is saying that um, what was provided to them included copies of multiple invoices and receipts seemingly randomly picked from the financial files. Uh, but may OGA themselves take issue with it. Um, and they said that they didn't get the email or didn't get to read it before Wednesday night's meeting and like, did contact Mayo and ask them for a response. And like it was very short, but in fairness, they got back and said, there were a lot of serious allegations and accusations made within the statement. We will issue a comprehensive and detailed response at our next meeting in the middle of October. Um, so, yeah, it's. I don't know if it's worrying or not, but it seems worrying when you're talking no, about that amount of money. No, it is worrying. And, and just uh, there was a line that stood out to me from the email that uh, was circulated around the clubs mm. uh, that was uh, meant to be read out at the county board meeting on um, on Wednesday night. It was last night. Now, I wasn't there, but just going on here, say the, meet, the email wasn't read out. And I think that's uh, to do with, as per the... A uh, statement that you would have got from AOG yeah. to say that like they haven't had um, they haven't had time maybe to or they need time to formulate a yeah. proper response and their response to this will be really telling because just um, I know we're getting it from one side but like the, the, the there was a fairly thorough um, email like fairly fairly thorough series of emails and documents sent yeah. around to the clubs that they wanted read out at the county board meeting and like for all intents and purposes it looks like all the eyes were or all the eyes were dotted and all the t's were crossed and and everything seemed in order. And there was there was one line that you mentioned about the copies of multiple invoices and receipts seemingly randomly picked from the financial mm. files. 
and it, it also says in the email that it included sensitive and personal information that it was deemed completely inappropriate to share um, which would obviously be of concern if you were anyway involved in that so th- th- this story has been rolled around Mayo since um, since around the time of the, the first All-Ireland because it was Kind of Mayo were being slagged again that there were more in the news than the teams yeah. actually in the All Ireland final. This wasn't just to do with Andy Moore and having announced his retirement. <laughs> and Jerry well. Caffrey, don't forget Jerry. Yeah, uh, Jerry Caffrey, which was a week after. Yeah, that was that was in the lead up to the replay. Yeah. So yeah, about a month ago, three weeks ago, uh, the Mayo GA Foundation announced, w- which they've elaborated on in their in their emails, that the, there was a breakdown in the relationship. And Tim O'Leary said he'd been c- become totally frustrated in his relationship with the county board and the unprofessional manner in which he conducts his business. So despite their best efforts to engage in a professional and transparent manner, the county board have failed to respond accordingly. Professional leadership required to take Mayo to the next level. Debate needs to take place and would urge all Mayo supporters to become involved. He said the lack of professionalism has motivated him to speak out, highlight the incompetence which exists within Mayo because he said he could have just walked away or turned a blind eye basically so he wasn't going to do that. Um, so I know like it's um it's just like I don't know what you, what you can say. Like it, it just looks very messy. So th- this is why I'm really interested in what the Mayo County Board have to come back with in response. Because uh, listen, it's not the first time the Mayo has been in the headlines for the wrong reasons in in recent years, mm. and a lot of it to do with governance level. So going back to the handling of um, James Horan's replacement, this is. Uh, before Pat Holmes and Noel Canelli yeah. were even appointed, there was a bit of controversy around that. Then obviously, it was, well, it was more to do with the players, but the the, the coup which saw Holmes and Canelli yeah. uh, got rid of. And then even going back to um, the manner in which Stephen Rochford's departure was was handled this year, and that, that, that they are all just they are all national stories about like you know um, high profile kind of management decisions and stuff like that. So, um, like I, I I don't know to like. On the back, so he withheld, I think, two hundred and fifty thousand, and this is on the back of him, the foundation between them donating seven hundred and sixty-five thousand to the foundation to Mayo GA within within the course of a year, four hundred and fifty thousand of that O'Leary claims fr- came from him personally. So, they, they, not to understand how much of a massive deal this is in terms of the the running of Mayo GA, like we probably would have seen in um, uh, in in various different kind of reports over the last couple of years, how much it costs to run the that's just the Mayo senior teams. And then just um, on the on the back of that, then after the breakdown of relationship, uh, the Mayo GA Foundation uh, announced that they're um, they're going to purchase 750 footballs, which uh, they announced this week that they're they're ready to distribute this week. So every pub in the county is going to get going to get a share of that as well. So it's like, so in one way, like the the Mayo GA Foundation are like they have the um, they have some backing from the from from a lot of the county for for because they have been so clear and thorough and yeah. how they've provided their documentation and because of gestures like this so that's why I go back to it again I'm rambling here I realise I'm going to stop but that's why it's so important how the Mayo County Board responds to this because it's not just a Mayo story now it's a national story yeah and the, definitely they're not the first county to be caught up in something no. like, you know, like this as well and uh, the foundation uh, part of that email it was a very uh, extensive email and they basically said they're withholding the money the 250 grand um until they get a number of commitments from Mayo, so it's six par- parts that they want covered, and um, before they can honour uh, giving over the money, um, they want secure backing and ticket sales for um, this event. We have given personal commitments that the highest level of corporate governance will be followed. So that's the first one. They want the highest level of corporate governance will be followed by the foundation. Uh, our accounts will be audited annually, and these accounts will be made available to all supporters who have made a contribution. Those supporters who have contributed wanted to ensure that there is full transparency in how their contributions are making an impact, these related projects. Um, before the funds are released, um, they'll need a review plan, and there's more detail about that. Um, once the foundation has reviewed each plan, conducted its due diligence, and trustees are satisfied that the best value has been applied each related project, then a contribution will be made directly to the project-specific amount. Um, and these protocols will be applied to all projects, both big and small. So we really want to sort of know exactly where every bit of their mm. money is going. Um, yeah, and it's probably not going to be the last we hear about that. So. No, and it's the, the worst thing about it is, um, like, I think in the emails, not the worst thing about it, but it's like, considering all the detail that, well, you've gone into there, that like the straw that broke the camel's back, um, accor- according to the emails circulated by the Mayo F- GA Foundation, was that uh, with the failure to provide 10 All-Ireland final tickets committed to at the gala auction in New York. And Tim O'Reilly claims in his email, obviously this hasn't been counteracted so the county board, so it's only one side of the story, but claims that he had to pay the county board 5000 
for tickets with a face value of 950 quid and that was the straw that broke the camel's back which led to the breakdown of this relationship in the first place so uh it's just all it's all it's all very messy it's all it's all a pity again that like uh, i was in the in the news for for the wrong reasons but um it's long winter we need something to talk about <laughs> yeah winter is coming um well they say they will uh bring a detailed and comprehensive response uh, in the middle of october um managerial roundups so you mentioned uh, Stephen Rochford for once he's not going to be mentioned in the managerial roundups because we're always just speculating <laughs> yeah. he's almost become like Alan Kirby because like, his job <laughs> comes up and Rochford's there Rochford's LinkedIn <laughs> yeah so David Poyer's taking the, the Tipperary football job it's a great appointment so he was the tip ball earning winning manager back in 2011 they beat Kerry in the Monster Semi they beat Cork in the Monster Final they beat Dublin in the All-Ireland Final not just any Dublin Dublin with a halfback line a minor team with Eric Lowndes John Small McCaffrey and in the forward line they had Cormac Costello Kieran Kilkenny and Paul Mannion so like you know, it's a yeah. Dublin golden generation like you know, well, one of many Dublin golden yeah. generations but um, David Power inspired the Tipperary team to go and beat them I think it's a great appointment like in the the team that he had was obviously there were no uh, you know they they weren't duds themselves but yeah, um, yeah. it's just interesting now to see if he can get the best out of some of these lads so Evan Comerford was in that minor team that he took charge of John Meher the fullback Stephen O'Brien at midfield Ian Fahey was in midfield that day and like he's somebody like sort of temporary or waiting to get the best out of over the last few years and you know maybe David Power is the man who can do that Bill Maher Liam McGrath Michael Quinn Livin T J Ryan hasn't been in the squad for a while, is he worth another look under the manager mm. who got the best out of him again? Like, you know, this is going to be nine years on from the minor team, so it's like, these boys could be coming into their prime now. Yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. And obviously a lot of those players that are still there will will have positive mem- memories of, of being involved with David Power before, yeah. you know. I just thought that um, like Tip were probably in a place um, last year that... Uh, like Liam Kearns did well obviously got them to an All-Ireland semi-final but it probably come to the end of the road and they yeah. probably just, sometimes just things come to a natural end and you just need a fresh voice and everything I've heard about David Power was, has been really positive not just with Tip but a little bit with Wexford as well and and funnily enough he's um I just looking there I think he's the first um first Tip native to manage a football team since 2006 so my really? kid, yeah so there's been wow. Seamus McCarthy was the last one uh, John Evans obviously uh, he was there for a good while, but he's director of football as well. And then um, Peter Creeden and uh, Liam Kieran's as well. So, um, Jesus. yeah, so that's first time in you know, cl- talking on close to 15 years. So I know it, it's a small thing, but it might give the temporary football people in temporary just an extra reason to yeah. kind of kind of back them again next year. So or it might increase the politics of temporary. Well, you, know, <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> no, it's good. Like, and Matty Ford obviously was with him when he took charge of Wexford. Uh, for a few years down there and uh, Niall did an interview with Matty Ford there yesterday Niall in the office um, Matty said I remember when he got the Wexford job first he rang me and asked would I go in one night a week wasn't long before it was full time that's the way he is he has a good way with people and he's able to get you around to his way of thinking so it sounds a bit like magnetic there as well and mm. yeah like there's a good um, Pillar Caffrey story that I once heard that he's very good at getting what he wants getting the players to basically come up with the idea that he wants to come up with so he's basically planting these seeds around the squad and he might hear five different ideas you know at a team meeting but when he hears the one he wants he's like oh yeah that's a good idea Connor <laughs> you know and then it feels like the group have come up with it and they've had some sort of control over it but like Pillar Caffrey all along wanted yeah. this idea to come <laughs> yeah. up and he picks that one out of five you know just discards the four other ones like and it's like you know when you go back to the, the, what's that old saying the art of diplomacy is getting get, let, letting people have your way so you know, basically, you're you're pretending like they're getting their way, but yeah, it's exactly yeah, yeah. what you want. And well, apparently, Pillar Caffrey, from from what I hear, he was good at that. And it sounds like that our friend David Power might be good at that as well. If he's able to convince Matty Ford to go from one day a week to full time, just like that. Just surprised it's not a story from your 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 time managing the club under sixteen. Was it under sixteen <laughs> back then? It sounds, sounds like classic Doherty. Piss off. <laughs> um, so it's going to be a hundred years next year from when Tipperary last oh, well. won the All Ireland. So. The time is now, Mr. Poyer. <laughs> there we go. David Fitzgerald, we go back to Hurling. Um, so Tommy Moran did a great interview of him in Midwest Radio. Um, and he's like, basically, Paddy Poyer has sp- have suspended betting on David Fitzgerald taking over uh, Galway, which is very interesting because it seemed like he might stay with Wexford. But in an interview, he said, my heart is torn, unreal. It's such a Davy line, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Like, I, I, can, I can hear him saying yeah, it, yeah. like, and, and the pain in his voice. So, um, it's probably two and a half. Uh, sorry it's probably two and a half to three hours down and the same back down obviously going down to train them that's three or four nights a week but listen I have a very special bunch of boys down mm. there 
anybody else, right? If I was reading those quotes and like you know reading him deliberately, and he did he did say by the way he hasn't spoken to anybody in Galway. Um, but <laughs> if I was reading those quotes, I would be like, ah, he's gone. But with Davy, there's just like yeah. you just can't trust it. His heart sometimes does overrule his head. Like so, even if his head saying might be a better job somewhere else this is crazy why am I still doing this we won the Leinster last year can it get better his heart will, will sort of override it I think sometimes and it's almost like remember Wolf of Wall Street it's like, I'm not fucking leaving <laughs> like you know so I'd say Davy could potentially say to himself yeah. I'll take the goal with you open and turn around and not take it well I, like I read that sentence and said that yeah Davy's gone yeah because yeah, especially because I think he said he's going to make a decision in the next day or two day or two yeah and I think like when everything before the butt in that sentence probably two and a half to three hours down and the same back that's three or four nights a week it's like right okay well then he's not prepared to do that anymore and when you compare it to the commute that he'd have in Galway because obviously hurling in, in Galway is predominantly to the south and east mm. of the county closer to Clare so like you're 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 halfing it and probably going probably going further again and, and to think that like I know it's going back a long time and he wasn't long out of playing when he did it but like d- Davy Fitz did the commute down to Wardford uh, you know back 2008 as well so yeah. he's like maybe he's thinking oh, my days of of you know three to four hour commutes just to get to training a few times a week are over um, it's funny he was talking to Tommy Marin on Midwest, like Midwest Radio is a, is a Mayo, predominantly Mayo based station yeah. uh, Tommy's a bit of a legend in the county so the good scoop for good scoop for Tommy oh yeah um, but uh, yeah I, I, I just think with, with weighing it all up even though like I, as far as I know the Wexford boys did that trip up to Clare again this year you know the I think Davey tells the story the summer before they all got a minibus and you know oh, this yeah, stayed and the night there but came yeah. down I think they did the same thing this year so um, <laughs> but maybe he's like yeah it worked the first time lad, but no it's a, you, you don't have me this time <laughs> but, trying to watch the TV uh, and yeah. a bus is rolled <clears> but, it's, but it's like if, if you're you can see you can see why the Wexford lads are doing that there's a clear connection there um, obviously not just the fact that he won a Leinster title for the first time in a long time but um, got the you know got them to within so close to beating Tip in the in, yeah. the, in the semi-final as well, uh, and just everything he's done, I just uh, I'm coming around to your way of thinking that he it will seriously pull at his heartstrings. But I just think when he weighs everything up, he thinks about it a bit more coldly and analytically that he probably think that the Galway suits him better, even though Galway have a traditional kind of. Um, not really gone and outsiders even going back to Lucknow and that didn't really work tended to point within their own county so yeah. uh, see how it goes but I'd be thinking go away at the moment mm. we'll see how that goes uh, next day or two he said he's going to make a decision but uh, Galway football something interesting brewing there as well because Connor Heenahan has been doing some investigative <laughs> journalist, journalism for us um, so like the, the favourites for that job are Parik Joyce and John Divley and not to sound like Sky Sports and we're talking about players on different flights and people spotted in different airports and stuff like that we did spot Parik Joyce and John Divley in a hotel in Dublin and Complete disrespect to the GAR. <laughs> they, they must not have realised that the hotel they went to was next door to the GAR studio, the hub yeah. of GA. Yeah. It's a it's a nice hotel. It's the Aloft Hotel for anyone that doesn't know. With a with a uh, the, with a view of Dublin from the seventh floor. Yeah. Like you know, it's all glass and the windows really nice up there. And uh, I call it. I'm, I'm not going to claim I planted myself there. It was accidental <laughs> investigative journalism. I was just uh, coming from lunch with a colleague, and who happened to arrive at the top of the lift? Tony Park, Joyce, and John Divley With uh, I don't know who the other guy was, but he he looked like he could have been a County board official, I'd say. So, uh, listen, there's been plenty of talk and in, in, there's plenty of speculation about the, the future of Galway management and John Divley and Park Joyce have been heavily linked. So, listen, maybe it was coincidence or yeah. maybe they were laying the groundwork for the next 10 years of Galway football right <laughs> yeah. there. Let's clarify. So, like, you know, they are favourites for the job and we saw them in a hotel with a random person. We are not saying they're That's connected. That's exactly it. That's all I'm saying. But John Divley and Park Joyce met in a hotel with somebody who we don't know who it is. But as Connor says, it looks like it could be part of a county board. Which county board, we don't know. But they're just two events that have happened and we're not saying they're connected or anything, but look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 21st anniversary of their 98 um, All-Ireland win this year. Maybe there was just three of them catching up with, <laughs> with an old friend for a drink or something like that. But. Uh, good stuff, Connor. Next up, we'll chat to Kieran Kilkenny. Your last time I saw you, you were uh, roaring down the barrel of a camera lens and let's go party. I know. Did you party? I um, definitely did, yeah. yeah. And we did a couple of days um, and then after, after that, that um, I was just back from New York this morning at 4 a.m. So a bit jet lag, but had a special couple of days over there. Um, and it's really important to do that to, to celebrate with your friends and family. Yeah. And like I've never seen anything like that before, the goodwill and positivity that's been towards us. So. To get all that from every, every person you see is really, really rewarding, really special. 
was New York planned or did the party just get out of hand and you ended up in New York? Yeah, <laughs> something like that, yeah. <laughs> now, a lot of guys would generally have things booked um, months and weeks in advance, just yeah. something to look forward to. Um, and I suppose after a couple of days um, after the game, um, believe it or not, it's a massive come down after the game because you're going from such exhilaration, excitement, yeah. giving so much mental, physical energy. And then you wake up on a Tuesday and you're lying in your bed and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> yeah. So it's nice to have something there in place that you can go off and do something and um, just enjoy some downtime. I suppose for you as well, especially like kicking four points from play in an all Ireland final, man of the match performance, yeah. you know, all action, like that stuff you dream about for like 20 years, right? Yeah, oh, if, like it was an incredible feeling, like it, like so happy on an individual and collective basis just to put in that performance. Like, and like, look, it was down to, the, to my teammates and management that they gave me the, I suppose, they gave me the responsibility to just go out there and confidence to go out there and just go for it. They said, look, Kieran, you just go for it, you go out there and enjoy it. But that was in my in, instinct, instinct as soon as the game starts and it was my intent to just go at the game. So as soon as I got the first ball, I had in my mind that I was going at it and I was going, going for it. So um, it was a mindset switch because before that in the game previous, my whole mindset was just to get the man the best position on the ball. Like our forwards are playing so well this year. Like, so my intent was getting the ball, going straight, being aggressive yeah. still with the ball, but I was getting a guy in the ball where it's this time I was being aggressive, I was intentful, but I was looking to get a shot or free and then maybe pass it off, but, but trying to get the balance between all those different things. So. Yeah, so you were looking to finish it yourself like this time rather than the first time? Yeah, like for example, the first day I was happy with my performance, I got a lot of assists, but I had no shots and yeah. at the end of the day I, I, I'm a forward, so that was my intent at the start of the game was to go at the game, get, be intentful and as soon as I get the ball turned, take my man on, put him on the back foot and um, get, get a shot off or, or but like you can't just go out and yeah. shoot and ball carelessly but just that have that in your mind like so that was in my intent leading into the game and, it was, and I was lucky and fortunate that the guys gave me gave me that response responsibility uh, to do that and just said go have fun like is there a, is there a selfish part of you that um sort of like because obviously you do so much work for the team that would want to do that more often like you're, you're playing that quarterback role a lot which is important for switching the play especially but you know you have that as well. Yeah, like that's like just I just want the team to do well and be selfish and do, help the team do well. But the management said for the team to do well, we need you to go at the game and and get some shots because you felt that that I hurt the opposition when I do get in the scoreline, and um, and like I felt um, that by using by doing that attempt from the start of the game, I think I set a precedent for the rest of the game for myself and I suppose some of the other guys had as well. I remember hearing a story, I think it was 2016, the league final, and Jim Gavin sort of just said to Brian Fenton beforehand, like, we need a big game from you today. Yeah. I think Jack Barry had gotten the better of him in another game, yeah. so it was almost like, you know, not today. Yeah. And I remember thinking, Geez, I didn't, didn't expect that from Jim, because yeah. we just see the sort of media persona, but yeah. would you have ever been on the end of that as well, like that finger point, and like, you have to deliver? Not really finger points, and like, <laughs> yeah. but like, I would have been in a, in a room, well, met with the, the three of the coaches, uh, Jim, Jason and Decky and they just kind of like it was nearly like I was coming into the principal's office like you know that kind of way they have that kind of atmosphere but uh, they just said to me like do you know we need you to do you know go at the game the next day you're a big player for us we need you to do this and I was just I was like wow well, these guys are who are massive role models to me and, and like family and uncles to me saying this to me I was like wow and just I came out of the meeting buzzing like I was like yes I'm looking forward to this game my preparation is going to be spot on and I was just I was literally like jumping up and down when I came out of the meeting like one of the other players was coming by to, to go in as well and just like we're just buzzing like I was like oh I'm really looking forward to that game and you can feel you can feel it leading into the game and even the dressing room in the game there's just like we were so prepared for the first game as well but you just felt that spark when we were going into the game in the dressing room and then on the field and like the first half was just at a phenomenal pace like both teams are really really going at it but I felt that us as a group performed really well, especially towards the end of the game when the cavalry came on. Like we were still creating goal chances to the very end. Like so, the most satisfying part was the preparation. Like when you put in and you prepare so well and to put in performance like that, it's the most satisfying, most satisfying thing as a player. Yeah. Do you, do you miss the club when you're like away with Dublin? You do miss the club. You, you, you like you you miss being around your friends. You miss that community element yeah. of it, but. Dublin as well is like it's like your family like yeah. it's like you're like it's, you're like it's, it, you, 
like the connection we have with each other like for me the get the, the big game changer for this group year this group this year more so than any other year was the bond and connection that we had within the group and um, i felt that that pushed us over the line when it came to the end was how much we we love and care for each other so that has been really really special but i'm looking forward to getting back to the club now because as i've said it's a massive come down from the year when it's all done yeah. but now as soon as you get into the club space you're back in the bubble of yes i'm at the club we're looking to do something this year as well is it hard, like, I remember even just when I go back to the club in Derry and hear a wedding, and boys are telling them, they got all these end jokes that you've missed out on throughout the year. Like, yeah. do you find that tough sometimes then? You're trying to catch up, you're being explained all these jokes or whatever? Ah, no, no, look, you're just, you're just, you get, you get on with it and have fun with the lads, like, and you still have the crack. They'll be slagging me, like, you know yeah. what <laughs> Yeah, here comes but, County now. Yeah, and especially about that one-liner, let's go party, they'll be slagging <laughs> me about that. And Did they have the Aquaman uh, video going around? Oh, them? yeah, I'd imagine they do, like, uh, <laughs> uh, everyone's seen at this stage. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, they'll definitely be slagging me about that, and that's great to bring, bring you back down to earth. And I'm actually really looking forward to getting back to reality, like, we've had a, couple, a week or two of great, great celebration, um, partying and doing cool things, like, they've gone to the States and the goodwill of everyone over in, in New York, all the Irish people over there was phenomenal as well. And it's great to see how far that has stretched over there. Like even guys, Irish Americans who vaguely know what GA yeah. is, know um, what we have done in terms of the achievement that we've done and how special it was that no one has ever done in history. To see that was like pretty cool. Like, I heard uh, you were a good man for taking a session or two at St. Pat's when you yeah. were there, even when you were with Dublin. Yeah, like I, I, I loved coaching. Like um, it's a similar buzz to playing. Like. And when I did my cruise shit, um, I got a great buzz from it. It was a great filler for me. Um, I coached the ladies team, I coached the hurling team, and I coached the men's team, football team as well. I did all of them. But it's the same buzz you get from um, playing. Maybe it's a little bit different because you have, have a lot of, you have a big responsibility on how the team plays and yeah. how me play. It was a different feeling, but both are equally something that gives you a great buzz and a great adrenaline. And for me, actually, that year that I did do that, it allows you to think about the game a little bit more yeah. and learn how things are, wh where you want players to go and stuff like that. So for me, I'd always encourage players around 18, 19, 20 level to help out at, at camps or even when you get a little bit older, coach teams, because you actually do learn about things a little bit more about spatial awareness, where you want people to be and stuff like that. So I felt that helped my game big time. That's an interesting one. What, what would you work on, say, if you've got time before training? Because you, know, you, you have to be good at everything. Yeah, really. like, yeah. you know, what would you specifically be focusing on if you're messing around? Yeah, messing around, what, what I'd be looking at is like specific plays where I'm looking to get guys on the ball and then executing a shot would be, would be a big one then as well. Um, but for me, my thing, those would be the two main ones for me is get, what kind of ways I want lads to go in terms of getting the ball yeah. and then shooting and it's, executing a shot in itself. Um, and then for are me, are you practicing like passing into areas in? Yeah, for, for different lads, that kind of that kind of stuff. And then, then for me, the big one for me is I'd back my endurance. I'm um, fortunate enough to have a good endurance base. So for me, it's just about to have about being fresh, going into the game. So making sure I'm spot on, like in terms of recovery, doing just the right amount of training, and then coming off the field. And because I know if I, my my legs are fresh, I'm in a really really good place, and I can run all day and perform in the game so I felt my legs are really good going into the last game and even towards the end of the game like when I was running up the field I was like yes yeah, I've more to, like even after the game I felt yeah I could I could play another game I felt that felt that good so it was great to be in that place. Does that give you confidence like do you feel that the boy beside you might be like breathing heavily and you know that you've got a few more sprints left in you? Yeah like it just like I have get great confidence when I'm fresh like because I know I can run all day here he like if I keep running and running and running and running it might be the 60 second minute, it might be the 70 second minute. I know I'm eventually going to get away from him, so or I'd back him, I'd, I'd back my running ability there, but you still have to be thinking about there's so many other different ways that you need to be thinking about and how to get free because you're, well, not fortunate, but I'm unfortunate yeah. enough that I'm one of the players that gets attention on the field in terms of man marking roles, so you constantly have to be thinking and learning of new ways and being creative on how you can get away from that person. Tell me, this is like it's a change of pace, but there's a review out today that was sort of backing the idea that junior cert history could be uh, optional. Yeah. Somebody who's got a degree in history. Yeah. Like you must be thinking that's a bit mad, right? Yeah, like I, I love history. Like I think like there's so much learning from from history that 
it's really important. I certainly wouldn't like to see that see that see that happen. But um, like there's so much even to learn from yesterday. Like that is yeah. history as well. Like and even our our past. Um, so I do think it's important that even if the junior sir, um, teenagers understand our history, especially our own history and European history and what went on, just to give them the context of where we are today. So I'd like to see that stay. Yeah, and like sorry, just finally, what sort of motivates you? You know, because like, any victory that I've had, I mean, life has been rare. Do you know, I'm not a yeah. serial winner like yeah. you. Is it as good winning now as it was five years ago? And then. Oh, what makes you want to keep going as hungry as ever? Yeah, I thought this was the most satisfying this one was. Um, really? This was better than, say, 2015? Yeah, I thought this was the most satisfying one. And um, for me, it's, I was on the plane there with, with Dino. And uh, for us, we were just saying, like, like, I'll be 27 next year, he'll be 30. Like, it's just, you want to be content when you're retired and you're, you know, um, you just want to be content and feel like you've done yourself justice in terms of being the best that you can be. And like for me next year, I'm looking at what I can do to be take every single box that at the end of the year, I'll be happy in myself that I gave it the best shot that I can. All you want to do is do your best. And there's always something that will motivate you. Like one year it might be, okay, I want to be... I want to do a bit of MMA because it'll help me get away from a player a little bit more. Not an aggressive way, yeah. but a little flicks here and there. Another year, it might be power, so I'm going to do more explosive Olympic lifting. Three, next year, it might be technical stuff, so I'm going to practice kicking. There's always something that's going to motivate you. And it's like anything, it's like playing a game of table tennis or pool or you know, um, tennis, soccer, or whatever sport it is. You always have that winning mentality when you get out onto the field, you want to win. So that's just the way humans are made and I suppose a lot of these guys in this team are made as well. So the bad news is you're not going away then? <laughs> is your all hope still hungry? Well we'll see like you know we the club championship now and then lads will be coming back then after that but I imagine lads will be fit, it, look, chomping at the bit now. Great stuff Kieran. Thanks, thanks very much. That Thank was great. Thanks. It's always good to have a Dublin player on the GA or isn't it? It's like um Will he gone to Australia? No coincidence. Well, yeah, again, <laughs> they're not connected. <laughs> but thought it was interesting there, Kieran Kilkenny, uh, talking about doing MMA one year. So to help him get away from players holding him, like that's really going to next level stuff of, of like preparation. Like you know when you're thinking, am I going to the gym enough, or am I doing enough mm. work outside? He's doing a whole different sport just to help with this one side of the game. Like, Specifically for that, as but like, Kieran McGinney did it for years, but Kieran McGinney yeah. was a fan of it, obviously. I think other players have done it, but I've never heard of them doing specifically to improve one single aspect of your game. Yeah, and in fairness, like, maybe he does get hold, I'm sure he does, because he doesn't stop moving. Like, and actually, somebody, like, boy in our club, he'd be our best man marker, and he said Kieran Kilkenny is the toughest player he's marked. Like, and he would be assigned to all the, the big guns, but he said Kilkenny just doesn't did stop. He say, did he say why? Did he... He said it doesn't stop, he's strong, he can win the ball in there. I didn't realise how tall Kilkenny was. I thought he it would have been under six foot, but he's over six foot one. Like he, he's so stocky. He's yeah, so that, stocky. That's why, yeah. yeah, I thought he would have been a, a bit smaller. And when I said that to him, he was sort of like... <laughs> 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 I felt like such a beta male around him. Like, you know? um, but a yeah, big man, he, so he can win the ball in there. He'll, he'll go just hunting for the ball wherever he wants. He can win it in full forward. And like, yeah, if he gets a chance, he'll go at you or put it over. Like, you know, yeah. club level, so... Um, it's interesting, interesting. Sorry, the story about um, you know the break between the two finals and like you know the how he played in the first game yeah, compared to how he played in the second game because what, to me how he played in the second game is how Kieran Kilkenny should play all the time and it's like uh, to, I, I maybe it's a matter of tactics from Dublin but like every so often he it's hard to say on the periphery because Dublin are normally winning these games comfortably anyway and Kilkenny has you know has some level of impact he knits everything together. Yeah. And, you know, he's obviously changed from, let's say, the, the era of the 50 possessions or 55 possessions when a lot of them were kind of hand pass and back and over yeah. the pitch against blanket defences. But, like, I thought he did it in the league uh, this year and last year when they would put him into full forward and just launch ball in. He's able to win any sort of any ball, sort as of he ball. said. He's so strong. Yeah. He's probably quicker than he's given credit for. Yeah. He's obviously clever. But um, just just some of the time, and when you when maybe when you have Paul Mannion and Conor Callan inside, you don't want to kind of clog it up. But he's so dangerous when he's just getting the ball close to the goal, going at people like Conor Callan goes at people like he can go at people and scoring, you know, one four or one five a game yeah. easily, as opposed to just you know maybe doing his two points and kind of knitting things together around centre forward. But like that version of Kilkenny that played in the replay to me, 
is the most dangerous version of of Kilkenny. Yeah, and it is interesting the way he's talking. Like you know, he he would mind doing that more often, but he obviously is given that specific role. And yeah, we talk. Like, I, I more than anybody talk about him going sideways and stuff. But that is a specific purpose, and it does serve a purpose. So he's basically quarterbacks that overuse terror, mm. but wherever the ball is, if they're going down one channel, he has to be the outlet on the other side yeah. so that he can get it straight back out and he can move it on to the next man. And it's, I wonder, does Jim Gavin trust anybody else to be as patient? Yeah, that's, no, it? that's 100% true, yeah. Do you yeah. know, because when you get the ball and you got a bit of space outside, you start looking inside again. Can I just ping this pass? <clears> and maybe he tailored the requirements to what Dublin needed in the final against Kerry specifically. Yeah. Whereas, whereas against maybe, you know, a team that's going to get way more bodies back behind the ball, that Kilkenny would have been more effective out the pitch and hitting the pitch. As he has to do. That that wasn't a complaint, as in sometimes he oh, has yeah, to go yeah. back and over and side to side. And Gavin, I, I would imagine, had identified the fact that, like, right, you were better used here because Gavin Crowley got the chance to try it to kind of marginalise him further out the uh, mm. further out the field, and maybe Gavin Crowley was thinking going into the replay, right? I not that I have him, but like, geez, like if I'm confident if I if I play like I did the last day that I'll do well against Kilkenny yeah. again, and Kilkenny and get Jim Gavin are obviously thinking we'll give this guy something completely different to think about. Yeah. There you have it, man. The match. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like I, I do like that whole side of Jim Gavin. Obviously, we don't see it. Why would he? Why would he show it to us in the media? But. Um, you know, like Kilkenny talking about having to go meet three of them, and Gavin basically laying it out for him. Like we, yeah. we want you to to win this game. Essentially, like we drew the last time, we need you to be the difference because we, we're at a bit of a stalemate here. And like that story I was sent him about Brian Fenton. There was an ex player who told me it was twenty sixteen league final, and if you remember, I think it was thirteen each to Kerry in Dublin drew mm. earlier in the year. I think it ended in a bit of a scrap as well. And um, that was the first time where Jack Barry sort of got the better of Brian Fenton. So this is only Brian Fenton's second year, but apparently before the league final, like Jim Gavin was telling it to him straight in the changing room in front of everybody, saying like, "Don't let that happen again." And I was like, "Whoa, yeah, go yeah, on, yeah, Jim." Like, and that's it, that's in front of the dressing room. I think you you said that Kilkenny met the three lads privately, yeah. but like, uh, you can imagine that the. Uh, the, the, the punch to the ego that there would be for Brian Fenton being challenged in front of a dressing room yeah. like that but then like but having the having the like intended effect that like well I'll, sh- I'll show you that yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> I'll be the best midfielder of all time <laughs> yeah, now for yeah. the next four years <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah and like you know and it, it's good because Kenny said oh, it felt great coming out of that meeting and I do remember this much smaller <coughs> scale but like we we lost this league final back in Derry we were trying to get promoted to senior in Derry the league is connected to the championship and um so I had a stinker. Like I brought off after forty minutes, and I thought, like, we're, like you're not out of it if you lose the league final. Even another chance you play the team here in the relegation playoff, and if you beat them, you can still get promoted. So we had this playoff coming up, last chance, and I assumed I was gone. And I knew the manager was under a bit of pressure because I was just taking up a forward spot doing mm-hmm. this sort of donkey role, like you know. And he pulled me aside to train him one night, and it was class. It was like, of, of course you're playing. You've heard enough of this shit before throughout your whole career. I don't know what it's about, but like you know. <laughs> you're playing because I know you can help us win this game and Jesus like, th- like I'll, I'll remember every part of that conversation for the rest of my life but you know when I still had a stinker the next I, was just, day. <laughs> I was just about to ask how did you play the next day I played alright actually I played alright but, um, but I, I did feel great and the fact that somebody's just throwing that confidence in you it, it makes you it's the complete opposite of playing safe it's like you want to you want to help them even more you want to run further you want to as Kilkenny was saying get on the ball and score like you know he, he got on the ball loads the first day but he wasn't having that end product so it's mm. just adding an extra dimension to your game just through words. Yeah. Never underestimate like the the power of man management and yeah, pushing the right yeah. buttons. I would imagine that a lot of it uh, a lot of Dublin players would have that kind of self motivation as well. Yeah. Like I said, like I think Johnny Cooper has spoken about it since as well, even between the drawing game and the replay, that even if Jim Gavin or the management team aren't calling you in, that you're having those conversations with yourself. Imagine Brian Fenton had the same, even no, you're talking about the 2016 one, but the first final didn't go particularly well for me. It yeah. wasn't outstanding in the second one either. It was much better. I watched it back the second time, right, and okay. it was it was way more involved than I thought he was. He set yeah. up like three points directly, but yeah, like not not, not, not Brian Fenton. Not, not Brian, maybe yeah. not the Brian Fenton that we've we've come to know over the last few years, but uh, but it's uh, but it's interesting to know that the to the granular detail that 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 the Dublin management do go to to feel yeah. that like you know what it will be a benefit if we call Kieran Kilkenny yeah. and somebody's experienced as talented as uh, who's won as many kind of individual awards I say as Kieran Kilkenny and who you'd never doubt his you know like I'd say even if Jim Gavin didn't have that talk that he still would have that he still would have you know been able to tell it upon him to call upon himself to do something different in the final but just I can imagine that no more than you back in Derry that he came away <laughs> exact from, same thing he came away from that meeting you know feeling 10 feet tall and geez, like obviously proved proved itself in the replay yeah well, Paddy Power predictions, Connor. We'll um, 
we'll not hang ourselves here and, <laughs> and predict some Ulster hurling games because <laughs> there's three games on this weekend. Uh, hurling final in Antrim, hurling final in Derry, hurling final in County Down. Um, there's one on TG Cahern. It will be a cracker. Cushion Doll v Dunloy. It's in Ballycastle, the North Coast. I, I recommend even just going, going to the North Coast, going to Ballycastle just for this just this occasion. It's going to be packed. Two big rivals in Antrim hurling, and like obviously that's where hurling's at its strongest in Ulster as well, up along that North Coast. Um, another big sort of hurling derby, um, in the Derry final, Kevin Lynch's. Don't give in, as you would know them the football, but separate, separate hurling club. Don't 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 ask. <laughs> um, and Sock Neil at the other side of the mountain, they're playing each other in Owen Big in the Derry hurling final. Um, and then down is Ballycran against Port of Ferry. The Antrim finals on three p.m. on Sunday on TG Cahir. Uh, do not miss that, Connor. Uh, who who do you have to to win these matches? Uh, Christian Doll. Yeah. Uh, Slot Neil. Yeah. And Don Given. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> close <laughs> I give you a choice Bally Cran or Port of Ferry oh, it's Port of Ferry all yeah, day long has to be. I would have with those three as well yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, yeah we'll not, we'll not um, like insult anybody by trying to analyse it in too much detail alright Paddy Power predictions Connor we'll not hang ourselves by making too many analysis or too many predictions on the Ulster Hurling finals don't know we'll be the the right well, man the right <laughs> man to call that so um you have uh, three deciders going on in antrim Derry, and down three three good games in fairness so um in the antrim hurling final that's on tg Cahir on sunday at 3 p.m it's cushion doll against dunloy massive rivals in antrim up in the north coast in ballycastle i really really recommend going along to that lovely part of the world two teams <coughs> who they hate each other let's be honest and they're playing in the heart of Antrim Hurling it's going to be a great a great occasion I, I would recommend going if you can't go it's on TG Cahar on Sunday in Derry two other big hurling rivals Kevin Lynch's uh, of Dungiven and the surrounding areas not part of the football club do not ask and uh, Stock Neil are playing in the final in Owen Bay at 4.30pm <clears throat> two clubs at either side of the Glen Shane Mountain so a bit of beef there as well and in the down final Ballycran against Port of Ferry who do you think is going to win these games, Connor? Go Cushion Doll. Yep. Slot Neil. Yep. Bally Cran. Bally Cran, interesting. I would have went Port of Ferry, but yeah, like, well. let's be honest, my knowledge of Down Hurling isn't as strong as it probably should be. Probably superior to mine, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. Cool. So that's like three three big finals uh, to look forward to, one on TV. And also the Dublin Club Football Championship is back. Dublin are out of the championship, so everybody gets to play football again. <laughs> Not in fairness, we all got to play during the league. Um, and the pick of the bunch is on Friday night. The Fina are playing Ballymun. I think it's quarter past eight in Parnell Park. Both teams need to win to go through. Two big clubs with big expectations. Ballymun and the Fina. Like, Jesus, Owen Merchant, Johnny Cooper, Conor McHugh from the Fina. Yeah. Ballymun and the 19 players that they have <laughs> playing for Dublin. Like yeah. That's going to be so Both need to win to go game. through. Both are Brilliant. on two points. Um, and they're two points off the top. Kilmacud are in the in, in the top of that group. They're playing Sylvester, so they should win that. They've got four points. The other two have two points. So it's basically a shootout to get into the quarterfinals between two big clubs with like big hopes of... Mm. Like, you know, they'd be talking about winning the Dublin Championship and now they're in a, a place where they're hanging on for, for dear life wonder who um who will Owen Merchant and Johnny Cooper mark for will it be Dean Rock or could be Paddy, Paddy Small. Small they have a couple of good forwards outside the lads that aren't on the county either like you know so yeah Bally Moon are strong as well like you know but their problems probably like always they don't have them for yeah, the whole yeah, year and then yeah. they just try to integrate them all back in I think they're their favourites are they Bally Moon are favourites yeah have Bally Moon in this one yeah you know what's like I don't know I might I might go in the Fianna Kill McCud here top of that group are, are flying like we played them in the league it's so hard to get the ball off they're so clever they just they just move it very well like you know mm. very smart team well set up and they know just how to get through and they are through Kill McCud are through already. they're through yeah they're already through um, and yeah that's happening all weekend Scary's right against Bally Bowden on Saturday uh, get out support the boys <laughs> not the Bally Bowden <laughs> boys because that's yeah. what you're how are you feeling confident Oh no! <laughs> sure, look, we're just happy to be, <laughs> to be playing at this level. So, um, no, Bally Bowden will be expected to to run up a twenty point win. Good, good, good. Um, but yeah, so the Dublin Championships going on. The Ulster hurling finals are going on. There's more elsewhere as well. I actually, should give a shout out to Mickey Linden. So we were talking about um Benny Coulter and what an achievement it was. At thirty six years of age, he's scoring so much in the reserve championship final and down for Mayo Bridge. 
Mickey Linden came on the same game and scored three points <laughs> at 56 years of age. We're talking about Declan Bonner in the same podcast, who's 54, the sprightly age of 54. Mickey but Linden's 56. Mickey Linden going. does it so often, though, that it's not, it's not a surprise <laughs> no, it's anymore. It's not even you know? a story. It was Darren Fagan who got onto me on Twitter to say, hey, <laughs> you missed the story. But, um, well, now I've corrected the story. Oh, Mickey what a Linden man. What a man. is still the top dog in Ulster and basically anybody above 50 playing Gaelic football. But that's all we have time for. Thanks very much for tuning in. We're back on Monday. As I said, we're not going anywhere throughout the winter, so don't you go anywhere either. And Willie is coming home soon, so get excited. See you later.